Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Monday, we had all good martinis. Yesterday, we had no good martinis. And today, we have two, potentially two and a half or three, depending on on how you look at it. The the last one's a little bit complicated. But, uh, Jim, let's dive right into the, the first one. And, of course, the Democrats are trying to paint the Republicans as obstructionist, as Putin acolytes, and whatever other pejoratives you can throw out there for their insistence on not passing clean legislation, as they say it, meaning nothing else attached, to continue spending tens of billions of dollars uh, in assisting Ukraine. Instead, Republicans also want to make sure there are concrete steps made to improve the situation at the border, which includes more money for uh, people and uh, equipment, but also asylum reform because it's being abused by so many people. You see these people coming across the border. You know, they officially, with the with the government, they claim asylum, which allows them to stay. And then if they talk to a reporter, oh, yeah, I'm just here for a better job. So uh, given the number of people coming and probably that being the real reason, there needs to be uh, steps taken to address that. And so yesterday, House Speaker Mike Johnson, on the same day Zelensky was in town, by the way, urging lawmakers to support more money for the Ukraine war. Mike Johnson went to the podium on the House side of Capitol Hill, said he's in favor of uh, more assistance for Ukraine, but he does want more accountability, uh, knowing exactly where the assistance is going and the taxpayers having an accountability and a record of that. But he also focused very intently on the need to do something now about the border. I have also made very clear from day one that our first condition on any national security supplemental spending package is about our own national security first. The border is an absolute catastrophe, and this is because of the policies of this White House and this administration. We had 12,000 illegal crossings on one day last week alone, on Wednesday. We have uh, almost now 280 known terrorists that have been apprehended at the border. None of this counts the gotaways. If you add the numbers up, it's almost 7 million people who have been encountered at the border just since President Biden took office and at least 2 million gotaways. This is twice the population of my state of Louisiana. Fentanyl is the leading cause of death for Americans age 18 to 49 in this country. Fentanyl poisoning because it's allowed over the border. We have human trafficking and all the other terrible things. In the last three months, October, November, December alone, We've had more illegal crossings at the border than in any entire year during the Obama administration. The American people see this. They feel it acutely. They see all the terrible societal ills that come from this, and it must be addressed. It's a huge problem, Jim. It's getting worse. This administration wants to separate the issues, which means they don't want to deal with it because they know the Democrats will kill whatever the Republicans want to do uh, in toughening up the border. Um, And so they don't like the fact that these two issues are getting uh, knotted together here. But uh, what do you make of the speaker standing his ground? Well, the speaker has a strong hand, and I think he's playing it very well. I think that messaging is is completely right. Um, And I just like the tone in which he's making his case. He's not frothing at the mouth. He's not shouting. He's just laying out very clearly that he's supportive of continuing to arm Ukraine. But the U.S. national security begins at the border. House Republicans have wanted to do something more on border security for quite some time now, including changes to the asylum rules. And we're seeing some signs that the Biden administration might uh, be willing to play ball. Four people familiar with the matter told CBS News that they're willing to support a new border authority to expel migrants without asylum screenings, as well as a dramatic expansion of immigration deportations in order to get Republicans to support aid to Ukraine. My, what I think is going to be frustrating about this is at some point, you know, I mean, also let's point out, immigration and the border are like Biden's weakest issues, right? The country is angry at him over this. House Republicans are throwing him a life preserver saying, here's a chance to address one of your biggest weaknesses as you head into a presidential re-election year. Biden should be begging them, not the other way around, to get something done on this. And my suspicion is, is that at some point, maybe the next couple of days, maybe the next couple of weeks, maybe we've got to wait till early next year, which would be bad. But at some point, Biden's going to say, okay. And he's going to give Republicans at least half of what they want on these border security and asylum changes, maybe like three quarters. He'll give them, a, they're going to get a lot. Probably not everything, 
but they'll get a big chunk of it. And in addition to that, we'll get, you know, funding for Ukraine, funding for Taiwan, funding for Israel. Everybody goes home happy. But I think this deal that Biden, I think, will eventually end up making, he could have had it in November or October or September. That this sort of agreement was always on the table. There was always in the works. The Republicans were always going to go for it. And because the administration dilly-dallied and because the administration seemed to believe they were going to get everything they wanted with no concessions, we're now in this point where it's brinksmanship and the, the clock is ticking and the Ukrainians are saying they're going to run out of armaments. Like, it's stupid. It is stupid strategy from a doddering old man who could have should have done this a long time ago, could have done this a long time ago, but chose not to. In part, I think, because they're used to he's used to the media having his back and covering for him when he's making an unreasonable demand and ignoring the fact that Republicans won the House, and that means they get some say in how this funding goes gets allocated to. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how much they give. Schumer and Biden, at this point, seem to indicate not at all. It's important for the Republicans to stand strong here. If they don't, their base is going to be deflated at a time when it's uh, really, really important, and it's just really, really important for national security, more important than uh, even the election that, that comes several months down the road. All right, let's uh, talk about our first great sponsor for today, and that is Provia. Are you scared of inheriting that hair loss or thinning look just because it might run in the family and trying to figure out by looking at your grandparents whether you're going to have to deal with this at some point? Now there's a real solution that delivers on its promise without the harsh side effects, the unwanted chemicals, and there's also no need for a prescription. It's called Provia. New customers right now are saving more than 50% plus free shipping on Provia's introductory package at proviahair.com slash martini. Provia uses a safe natural ingredient, Procapil, which effectively targets the three main causes of premature hair thinning and loss. Provia supports healthy scalp circulation, it delivers nourishing nutrients, and it can help develop healthy hair follicle anchoring to your scalp. It's effective for men and for women of any age, and it's safe on colored, treated, or styled hair. Don't wait. Order now. Save an extra 10% off just in time for the holidays as well at proviahair.com slash martini. That's P-R-O-V-I-A hair.com slash martini. All right, Jim, on to our second good martini now. And while most people today are focusing on Hunter Biden stopping his feet and refusing to testify behind closed doors uh, on Capitol Hill and demanding a public and open hearing. We'll see uh, who wins that game of brinksmanship. But our good martini today is actually something related to a different part of Hunter Biden's legal problems right now. And your colleague, Charlie Cook, uh, referenced this over at the corner today, uh, courtesy of Axios, actually. He says, it looks like we're going to get Hunter Biden versus Joe Biden over the Second Amendment. Uh, according to Axios, the gun charges against Hunter Biden, this is according to uh, Abby Lowell, Biden's attorney, are unconstitutional under the Second Amendment, and the case should be dismissed as a collapsed plea agreement still grants him immunity, according to federal filings on Monday. Abby Lowell also addressed uh, the indictment that alleges that Biden illegally owned a gun as a drug user and that he lied on a federal firearm purchase form, arguing that recent court rulings meant the charges were unconstitutional. And they're referring to the Bruin case, I guess, two summers ago now in that case out of New York, which broadened Second Amendment rights. Quote, because persons protected by the Second Amendment can no longer be denied gun ownership due simply to past drug use, a practice inconsistent with this nation's historical tradition on firearm regulation, any false statement by Mr. Biden concerning his status as having used a controlled substance no longer concerns any fact material to the lawfulness of the sale, quite simply asking about Mr. Biden's status as a user of a controlled status, or should be substance, I guess, is constitutionally irrelevant to whether he can be denied his Second Amendment right to gun ownership. And so it's interesting how they use past tense in a lot of that when we know that he was an active user at the time of the application, Jim. But it's interesting. I think the, the, the Hunter Biden legal team is trying to put the Supreme Court in a pickle here. Either they clear Hunter Biden or they weaken the Second Amendment here. And I think what's going to happen, given this court, is they're going to strengthen the Second Amendment uh, if, in fact, it, uh, it gets that far. Yeah. Look, this has really turned into one of the more fascinating stories in our politics. And some of it's because you've got people who are very closely interconnected. Hunter Biden, President Biden the Democratic Party as a whole, and I'm going to go one step further out and say the mainstream media, separate from the Democratic Party, but often rooting for them. They're used to working in tandem, and now all, at least three or four of them, have very different priorities. 
Unsurprisingly, the top priority of Hunter Biden is staying out of jail, which means that he have to su has to suddenly wrap himself in the Second Amendment and say, I am a American gun owner, and your interpretation of the laws represent a rest unfair and unconstitutional restriction of my Second Amendment rights. Uh, as properly enshrined in Heller, it's, then he's going to do it because it's going to help beat the rap or conceivably help him beat the rap on one of these cases. Now, at the same time, this is completely at odds with President Biden and his general approach towards gun control, as well as most Democrats and as well as most uh, folks in the uh, mainstream media. Joe Biden for obviously doesn't want his son to go to jail. And I think you look, you look at the way Joe Biden talks about this. Uh, issues regarding his son. Obviously, he wants his son to stay out of jail, but he also doesn't really want to concede that his son, well, for lack of a better term, is is the dirtbag we kind of knew he was. Uh, we've, we've been seeing that he is. There's a really intriguing section of a Washington Post editorial on this. And let me point out, I did not, uh, you know, the, the, I write columns for the Post. They don't ask me for my opinion on their editorials. But like, you know, it says, quote, Hunter Biden would never have earned most of the money he allegedly dodged paying 1.4 million in federal taxes over four years, if not for his last name. Lacking experience in the energy sector, he had no other qualifications for the board of directors of Burisma, the Ukrainian firm that hired him in 2014. That should have been a scandal when Joe Biden was vice president. I think it's a fairly significant concession from the, our friends at the Washington Post editorial board. It was also a mistake, albeit an understandable one, for the older Mr. Biden to insist later that his son had done nothing wrong, that's a direct quote, when he clearly has behaved so grossly, personally and professionally. Nor should the president have falsely claimed in October 2020 that his son has not made money in China. So you're seeing Biden get raked over the coals here because you see, I think, in the eyes of the mainstream media, this desire to, to you know, get rid of the dead weight. The mainstream media is not that, you know, uh, invested in the well-being of Hunter Biden. They can see this. They can, they're can they kind of disgusted by it. And I think they, you know, everybody can see at absolute minimum, Hunter Biden was selling access to his dad. Now, he could put his dad on the phone and allegedly they'd only talk about the weather, wink, wink. Um, but I think everybody, like the ideal of the media and the Democratic Party and Biden himself is to say, you know, this was all really bad, but it was all Hunter Biden. And Hunter Biden is the one who should suffer the consequences, not Joe Biden. But clearly there's some part of Joe Biden who cannot answer questions about this without speaking in the broadest generalities and giving these blanket denials that are later proven false. My son has done nothing wrong. He never made any money in China, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that makes him look bad. And I think this could be because Biden genuinely cares about his son. This could also be, I think Biden does not want to acknowledge that whatever fathering he brought to the table, whatever parenting he brought to the table, Hunter Biden did not turn out well. And Hunter Biden has been struggling with addiction for a very long time. His family has tried to get him into rehab. He's gone through rehab. It hasn't, it hasn't worked. And Hunter Biden is just the guy who seems to make the wrong decision every possible time. And Joe Biden's instinct is, nah, my son's a great guy. He's the smartest guy I know. No, he's not. So that's where we are. We're in a situation where all four of these groups are trying to save themselves effectively. And uh, we'll see how it shakes out. But I think it is kind of, if nothing else, we can enjoy themselves as the president's son comes out as a forthright, full-throated <laughs> defender of American Second Amendment rights. All right. Uh, let's talk about another great sponsor for today. And that is for Patriots, makers of the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. It's new and improved, as you know, if you listen to us regularly. Solar generators do charge more devices for longer in a blackout. And the Patriot Power Generator 2000X now has double the capacity and more peak power than before. Plus, it has new expandable capability for even more power. Yes, you can take it on outings like camping trips or picnics, but the most important thing is that you have it on hand, charging in the sun with that solar panel that it comes with to power your fridge, freezer, medical devices, and other devices uh, when the power goes out. It never needs gas, obviously, since it's solar powered. It's fume-free, it's silent, and it's safe. Visit 4 slash martini to see this week's discounts and deals before they are gone and to get free shipping on orders over $97. Save more and get peace of mind now by going to the number 4Patriots.com slash martini. That's 4Patriots.com slash martini. All right, let's move on to our complicated martini now. It's better than I thought yesterday. Let's put it that way. And that's... Uh, 
Glenn Youngkin, the Virginia governor, who we generally like on a wide variety of topics, but he's got this itch to bring D.C. sports teams into Virginia, which I am not a big fan of. Not that long ago, he was trying to lure the Redskins turned commanders into uh, Virginia, which would not only be right next to the worst bottleneck in Northern Virginia, but the worst bottleneck in Virginia, and by some studies, the worst bottleneck in the entire country. But uh, now, looks like he's pretty much sealed the deal, pending approval from the Virginia General Assembly and the Alexandria City Council, to bring the NHL's Washington Capitals and the NBA's Washington Wizards to the Potomac Yards location in Alexandria, which is located between Reagan National Airport and Old Town Alexandria, already a pretty clogged thoroughfare. There was already a major complex developing here, but now Ted Leonsis and his monumental sports group, which owns both teams, um, is apparently agreeing to the, the deal here. What I thought yesterday was that Glenn Youngkin was offering a sweetheart deal and tax breaks and all sorts of things, uh, which is why I tweeted out, wish Youngkin would stop doing this. If you're in position to cut sweetheart deals for pro sports teams, you should easily be able to cut my taxes, which is still true. But uh, Jim, you've done more research on this since uh, we had that Twitter exchange and found out that Virginia taxpayers would not be on the hook. Alexandria taxpayers, to some extent, would be. Um, And who knows exactly how it would play out with uh, uh, tax breaks down the line or infrastructure changes and what have you. There's still pros and cons about having a complex like that in that location, but uh, better than we expected because the uh, while, while we don't begrudge billionaires, having billionaires ask taxpayers to foot the bill for their new facilities always grinds my gears. Yeah, look, uh, again, this is this, there are a lot of moving parts to this. This is the deal as we understand it now. As I just put in a corner post, uh, the deal that gets announced when they have a big development like this and the deal that actually goes into effect aren't always the same thing, so we're going to have to keep an close eye on this. First of all, let's begin with the general sense that, as, as you mentioned, the traffic concerns this is a part that's already pretty well developed and tough to get to on a normal day. Given a choice, I would rather have my sports arenas be in the middle of a city in kind of equidistant from all the suburbs and all the different directions. Once you put it in one part of a metro area, then everybody's got to head in the same direction, and that works. Uh, that, that makes traffic worse. Um it appears that the state of Virginia will not be p- directly paying for any arena construction. And if that if that holds out, that is good news. Uh, with that having been said, it's going to establish a new state-established entity that's going to ta- effectively be taking out loans by issuing bonds. You know, when a state or a state, issued, or state entity issues bonds, basically you buy them and are effectively loaning them money, and they will pay it back to you with interest over time. Uh, and the plan is, is that state taxpayers will not be the ones paying back those bonds. The money to pay back those bonds will come from uh, parking fees and stuff like that. I'll, I'll, I'll read you from uh, the deal as I understand it. The $2 billion investment would be supported through bonds issued by the proposed authority. This is the new Virginia Sports and Entertainment Authority that would own the land and the businesses within this new entertainment district, as well as a $403 million investment by Monumental Sports, which is the entity owned by Ted Leonosis. You got a sports arena, you get corporate headquarters for Monumental Sports, a media studio, Wizards practice facility, performing arts venue, and an expanded e-sports facility, along with retail, restaurants, hotels, conference community spaces, stuff like that. Everybody says, oh, it's going to be terrific. It's going to develop a lot of, you know, and it should have some positive economic effects. The bonds for the project would be repaid through annual rent paid by Monumental and arena parking revenues, naming rights, and incremental taxes generated by the arena and development of the first phase, according to Youngkin. The city of Alexandria, where I no longer live, and I'm kind of glad that I don't, would contribute $56 million towards the construction of the performing arts venue and $50 million towards the underground parking development. The land and buildings would be owned by the authority, which would enter a 40-year lease with the company, meaning Monumental Sports. So again, as of this point, it looks like the state will not be kicking in any money directly. If you live in Alexandria, sorry, you're paying in. It looks like $106 million uh, towards the performing arts venue and parking development. But look, when you look at stadium deals and how arenas go, this isn't that bad. And the other you know, asterisk I would point out to this is that I, as much as I vehemently oppose uh, taxpayer dollars ever going towards an arena. When it comes to the infrastructure you have to put around the arena to get people in and out, whether that's, you know, 
you got to, you know, tear up and redesign some streets, whether you got to put in a new highway interchange, public transportation, metro stops like that. I actually have less of a problem with taxpayer dollars going towards that because it's kind of unreasonable to ask a sports team to build a new highway interchange. Um, so I, I, I can live with that. And all in all, this deal doesn't look that bad. Like you, Greg, I didn't really think Northern Virginia needed two professional sports franchises. And I think it's going to be really terrible news for downtown Washington, D.C., which has been looking pretty bad for ever since the pandemic. But I suppose this deal could have been much worse. Good news that the taxpayers won't be on the hook. I think it could be a logistical nightmare for those who live in the area. And bringing in a major casino to the area also brings in some elements that the neighbors might not like. But uh, we'll see again what the final details are. This might be considered uh, backyard politics for us, for those who don't live in the area. But uh, I think we've seen this play out so many times around the country where people will take as much government assistance as they can, meaning taxpayer assistance, which means you're paying for for that stuff to happen. And so if if Youngkin could actually avoid that happening, that's that's a major win, even if I still have misgivings in, in a number of different areas. But saving my tax bill is the biggest concern here. So props to him if he can actually pull that off. Anyway, Jim, on that note, we will uh, call time for today and reconvene tomorrow. See you then. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. Do subscribe to the podcast if you don't already and tell your friends about us as well. Thanks also for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us both on X. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a terrific Wednesday and join us again on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.